Hi, my name is Rocky Brody. I uh, am the Senior Director of Marketing here at Fredos.com. And just a word about myself before we get started. One of the aspects of COVID-19 that's been particularly challenging for me beyond all of the safety and health issues that we've all seen going on is the fact that I'm really not good at watching TV for extended periods of time. Uh, and that means that I also am not somebody who's particularly skilled at watching a Zoom screen or a video chat for extended periods of time either, especially when you're just watching. And so what we promise you today is that this will not be that. This is going to be entertaining. We want it to be like a lively conversation. We brought in for you uh, Ari Corman, our VP Sales, and Sam Hebner, one of our uh, star importers who uses Fredos.com to really entertain you. If you don't like just watching TV at once, feel free you know, to be doing anything from working at the same time, checking your email, doing your to-do list, folding your laundry, whatever it is, uh, keeps you stimulated. But, uh, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And one of the aspects that actually inspired us to move from the regular webinar platform to what we're going to do today, which is a lot more like a fireside chat, is uh, my long car rides to work pre-COVID-19. And I used to listen to lots of podcasts. I'm actually back in the office right now. I don't know how many of you are back, uh, coming back into your offices and how many of you are still working from home. Um, but one of the things that I would listen to is podcasts and the type of podcasts that I like best personally are ones that are much more conversational. I, I don't really have to pay a lot of attention, but I always come into the office stimulated with something new. Uh, so the goal here is really not to try to memorize every piece of advice that you get, but to really think about uh, importing the challenges that you see that are brought up and how that can uh, help you out. So we hope everyone has a great time, uh, that you laugh a little, and that you learn something. So the new theme of this uh, new uh, series, or fireside chat series, is really from here to there. Uh, when we think about what people want to hear and what importers, today freight is really, really complicated. And even in a digital age where so many things are online, Freight still seems to have a lot of different pieces. And when you think about it, you know, we could, we could stand here. We love talking about freight it's, uh, and how simple it is. But what we thought would really make it seem most approachable and most simple for our uh, customers or even anybody who came onto Freightos.com is to see the real episodes of other importers like yourselves who are taking it from here to there who are taking their business and scaling it, who are, who are facing different problems and finding challenging solutions. And so for today's first episode, we're gonna take you from here to there uh, as you meet Parker Baby. Let's talk agenda for a second. So first, I'm just gonna give a really brief overview of what Fredos.com does. Uh, the purpose of our chat today is really not to talk about Fredos.com, it's to talk about how simple freight can be and to learn about freight. So then we're gonna jump right into our fireside chat between Ari Corman, who you see, and uh, Sam Hebner, the CEO and co-founder of Parker Baby. And then we're gonna be here with any Q for a live Q&A. Uh, just a couple of technical notes before you get started. If anyone here has trouble with audio or video, uh, feel free to ping us directly in chat or in the Q&A. If you have questions that come up while you're listening, feel free to write them in the Q&A and we'll incorporate them. We know that some uh, listeners already sent us questions in advance and some people will come up with them, but hopefully we'll answer some of them on the spot and some of them um, at the end. We also uh, have here today Aya and Nomi from our team who will be answering and uh, coordinating with you guys live so that if you want to be interacting with us, feel free and you can always reach out to us afterwards. Um, and last but not least, we always get this question, we will be recording uh, the chat, and so you don't have to take notes, you can continue multitasking, and we will send this to you afterwards. Uh, so let's get started. Great, so I'm just gonna talk for a second about Fredos.com. Uh, Fredos.com is uh, the digital freight platform that connects small business importers with logistics providers in order to really make your life simple when it comes to comparing, booking, and managing your freight um, all in one place. So everything from rate comparison to going online and booking your shipment the same way that you would book anything online uh, to then coordinating with your logistics provider and seeing and tracking and managing all of your shipments. 
And our goal here today is really to do just that, to make your life of freight as simple as possible so that you can focus on running your business. So that brings me to introduce here uh, Sam. Uh, so nice to meet you, and we're super excited to have you. You can see here, Sam, um, why don't you just actually jump right in and tell us, you know, why we chose you, who you are, what's going on, and, and talk a little about Parker Baby. So uh, thanks for having me here, guys. Really appreciate this opportunity to kind of talk about everything that Parker Baby is and, and uh, our process and how we've come to be. Um, yeah, my, my wife and I started Parker Baby uh, about five years ago. Um, and it was totally just kind of a side gig right about when we were starting to have kids. Uh, my wife was going to be a stay-at-home mom. I was working in investment banking at the time. Um, she, had some, uh, she had some ideas for some products that uh, we were spending a lot of money on baby products. And she had some ideas to improve uh, some of the products we were buying. She had some new ideas for new products. And we um, essentially started with a really small order um, under our brand and uh, it uh, the first product just kind of took off and we launched on Amazon initially and um, Amazon has kind of been our bread and butter up to uh, about a year ago and things kind of kind of uh, diversified a little bit for us which I'll talk about later but um, our goal all along has been to grow our product line um, as our children grow so we I've gone from you know starting with uh, baby bibs that are designed for infants doing stuff up to um, blankets and, and towels and stuff like that that are more designed um, for uh, toddlers. So um, we've gone from those first few SKUs to um, about 60 SKUs today. Uh, our stuff is manufactured in China, India, um, Cambodia, Turkey, so kind of all over the place. We're still a small team. Uh, we uh, have two full-time employees. My wife has stepped away. We hired a marketing director uh, who's full-time. We have a couple part-time employees. And um, yeah, I mean, I quit my, my day job uh, in investment banking a couple of years ago when things kind of uh, started to take off. And the time commitment for Parker Baby to really do things right um, was just too much. So um, yeah, that's kind of the, the, the uh, two-minute elevator, elevator pitch for Parker Baby. Well, great. And uh, thank you, Sam, for the uh, excellent introduction. And just to introduce myself, again, my name is Ari. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Customer Success at Freight Us, and I've been here for uh, since the beginning, so it's almost eight years. Uh, and this is a new series to really introduce all of you uh, as part of the Freight Us community to some of our you know, successful entrepreneurs who really went from an idea had, you know, to initial samples and all the way through to really starting to scale a business. Um, so it's really a, really a great pleasure to be with Sam today, and hopefully a lot of you in the audience, um, without having the opportunity to speak to every, each and every one of you, uh, are in a similar position of looking at new, new product lines, thinking about how uh, to make that profitable, you know, studying different channels that you can sell through, how you're, on earth you're going to ship this stuff, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to benefit from our conversation with Sam, uh, who's going to sh continue sharing with us some of the insights that he's had over the last five years uh, in building up uh, a successful uh, a successful business. Um, just to put some numbers in uh, into perspective, right, in terms of sales, right? Uh, Sam alluded to it, and I'm going to then uh, ask some questions, right? We're talking about really, really significant growth, right? Year over year, 300%, 100%, 60%, uh, even in very, very difficult environment now in 2020 uh, in terms of annual year-over-year uh, -year growth. That's not easy to do, uh, especially uh, in the environment that we're in and, uh, you know, selling to, to, to consumers that are uh, potentially not, uh, you know, we're not working and not, uh, so to be able to grow a business during this difficult time has been very, very impressive. So let's just dive in and I really want to understand a little bit more, Sam, um, you know, what's the backstory and, and how did you come up with this idea? Uh, you mentioned that you had you know, uh, little kids, but what really uh, did you see that was maybe lacking in the market? What was really the idea or where did you think that potentially you could do something different uh, than what was originally or what was currently available in the market? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, you know, we really um, initially just started with the, the one SKU with a few different variations. And um, we started with, with bids that, uh, were relatively common, although we changed how they were fastened. My wife, you know, was getting frustrated with 
bibs that we were using on our own kids. Um, most of them had Velcro. Velcro would destroy stuff in the wash. It would get all messed up. Um, and then uh, probably even more important for my wife was she just didn't like the designs and the patterns that she was finding in the market. Um, and it kind of seemed like there was, uh, you could either spend, um, you know, $40 on a set of bibs and get the patterns that you wanted, or you could spend, you know, $15 on a set of bibs and uh, you'd be sacrificing a lot of quality and uh, probably be uh, patterns that you didn't necessarily like that you would be reluctant to put on your baby. So um, the bibs really came, they really truly were inspired by our children. Um, one of our twins um, had uh, acid reflux issues and was constantly spitting up. And so we were constantly changing clothes. Um, so we tried to find a way that we could put a bib on, on her that would, uh, would be fashionable, that we would feel comfortable, you know, putting it on her on, with any outfit and not, you know, have like a plastic or a, um, you know, like a rubber bib on her. And uh, so she was really the inspiration for that. Um, and then, you know, as we've added products, I would say our kids um, totally have uh, been inspiration for a lot of our products. Our other twin didn't really, she, twin girl, she didn't really have hair until she was, uh, you know, almost two years old. And so uh, we were, you know, having a hard time finding bows and hair accessories that we liked. So we kind of naturally transitioned into doing a lot of hair accessories because, it was something that my wife knew a lot about. It was something that we knew we needed. It was something that uh, was difficult to find at the time. And so we kind of moved ourselves into this market being between, you know, uh, generic, uh, cheap bibs, hair accessories for um, on eBay or Amazon. Um, we're kind of in between there and what I would say like the luxury brands are where you're certainly spending a premium um, and uh, which is largely dominated by brick and mortar. So we're kind of in between those two, I would say. Well, that, that's really helpful. And by the way, for those who haven't yet gone to the website, uh, parkerbaby.com, uh, again, parkerbaby.com, uh, you can also just search for it uh, on Amazon. For example, the uh, Birch Bag, which I think is the most popular product, uh, and some of the newer products as well. So you'll see that uh, in, in Amazon, I know many of you are probably Amazon sellers or multi-channel sellers. Uh, you'll see that uh, some of that definitely comes through, and we're going to get to this a little bit later in the chat around the marketing and the branding and how the community has grown. But you'll see that there, it's kind of has that sweet spot from a pricing standpoint, uh, also offering new customers uh, the ability to, to kind of join a community uh, and really seems to be uh, you know, a, a, good, a good combination of quality uh, and price. Um, and, and that includes also a lot of versatility in terms of the product. And that really is interesting, Sam, in terms of, you know, the beginnings. You mentioned, you know, that came from real life needs of, of your kids. And, you know, even in the way that the product I see is advertised uh, on Amazon, right? For example, the Birch Bag has 10 pockets, right? So you, don't, you can buy one product and actually get multiple uses for it. So it's storage, it's cool, you can, you know, use it for, uh, for different purposes. So I'm just curious in that regard, um, how, how hard was it for you to, to actually design a uh, prototype you know, actually analyze the initial samples that you got uh, and really walk us through, you know, the audience through um, what that design process looked like and then how you actually manufactured your first product. Uh, really the nuts and bolts, I know that we don't have a lot of time, but just to hit on some of the major points there. Uh, yeah. The product. Yeah. So, um, you know, like for the bibs, we started out, I had no experience in product development. Um, like I said, my, my experience was really in, in finance and, um, I had some entrepreneurship background, but I had no idea what I was doing really. And, you know, to be honest, we kind of lucked out with that first product with an awesome uh, supplier who really guided us along the way. And um, his, uh, we continued to work with that supplier five years later. And for obvious reasons, I mean, he's That's just, the one in India or the one in China? That's the one in, in India, He's right? in India. Yeah. Okay. So he's in India. And we, um, so we started with him and he just, his sampling process is so quick and efficient and his communication is awesome. All, the, all those things are so important when working with suppliers. And so, um, you know, he really, on that first product, really guided us and really um, provided quick feedback, provided quick samples. And we really had no idea what we were doing. I mean, we had outsourced kind of like the pattern, uh, pattern side of things to someone. And with the guidance of my wife on getting patterns developed, we still, I mean, developing colors, choosing colors, stuff like that, that I would have assumed to be so simple. We're, actually not. And um, we really relied heavily on him. 
Um, you know, then we moved on to more complex products. I mean, certainly the backpack was kind of the first, uh, first product that we really, um, you know, started from scratch and could not just depend on a manufacturer to, to kind of uh, guide us through the whole process. So we ended up hiring a uh, product designer for that product who um, drew out the, the design pack, the tech pack for it. And uh, we took that tech pack and, and kind of shopped it uh, with manufacturers in China. Um, then my first trip out to China a few, or I guess four years ago, was to meet with several potential manufacturers for this product. And it was a huge learning experience. I mean, you're talking about so many more um, different types of materials and uh, colors and, uh, you know, a lot of little things can go wrong in a backpack, which I hadn't really realized. Um, but once again, we ended up finding an awesome uh, supplier. Uh, actually, wasn't on that first trip. We actually um, hired a product developer consultant uh, a couple of years ago, and she had a connection with a um, manufacturer in China who uh, had a lot of experience in bags, who produces for um, some, some larger brands here in the U.S., including like uh, Cabela's and some other large outdoor brands. And um, we really worked with him to improve our bags. I think our bags initially were, we had some quality control issues. And um, when we got in front of this manufacturer, he kind of just picked it apart and just said, hey, you know, we can improve this and this. And if you, you know, spend 10 cents more here per bag, well, it'll improve, you know, these issues you're having with the zipper or something else or a material, a certain yeah. material. So, um, we really leveraged that relationship with him and um, it worked out really well for us. But yeah, it was, um, it was complex with the backpack and we certainly had to learn, um, learn a lot those first couple of years. So, so how, how, how much later did that actually help your business by diversifying between India and China and having those suppliers, like in terms of over the last year with some of the trade wars, the significant increases in duties, I know that we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but how important was that for you to kind of diversify your supply chain from the beginning effectively? Yeah, it's been super important. I mean, obviously over the course of the last six months, really, um, it's been even more important for us. And, um, you know, India, uh, although it's a little bit more complex to source from India, in my opinion, than China, um, we've you know, through the COVID, when COVID first hit early this year and China was shut down for extended periods on, we weren't really um, freaking out because, uh, you know, 50% of our SKUs are made in India. We were well stocked on just about everything else. Um, and, you know, and actually um, in regards to the trade war, uh, our manufacturer, uh, our backpacks, which is our most expensive item, um, when those were hit with the, the Trump tariffs, um, that was pretty painful for us as you can imagine. Um, and uh, our supplier in China, he's a go-getter and he under, he kind of saw the writing on the wall and he actually went to Cambodia and opened up a factory in Cambodia, um, which is a free trade zone with the US and uh, a little bit more expensive from a product cost standpoint, but you know, you're saving that 20, well, it's actually more than 25% when you include the original tariff on it. So, um, you know, we were able, and without having to go through an all like a completely new supplier. We were able to move our production to Cambodia essentially overnight as soon as they opened wow. um, without having to go through the entire sampling process again and, um, and all that stuff. So that was, I mean, that was huge for us. And uh, we did I mean, and, 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 and the interesting thing there, Sam, I mean, and for the audience, right? Uh, this is somewhat of a microcosm of what the uh, business, a lot of businesses are doing. Uh, we, you <clears> know, for when we speak to SMBs, all of our customers really looking to diversify a lot of Chinese suppliers like you described are actually opening up now offices as Chinese uh, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in other countries uh, to offer some of the, the more, I guess you could say kind of scalable elements of production and also complicated elements of production uh, that have really been optimized in China, but had not yet been optimized in other countries yet mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia, uh, but transferring that knowledge now and opening up new supply chains, uh, also to, to, you know, that importers, especially in the U.S., uh, can benefit from at the lower duty level. So that's very, very interesting. I, I want to shift gears now a little bit from uh, kind of sourcing in terms of actually launching the product. You mentioned that you kind of got your start with Amazon uh, and selling at Amazon, although now I know that you've diversified and seeing a larger percentage of your revenues coming as well from your own website. Can you walk us through a little bit what it was like to actually launch at Amazon 
and uh, you know, some of the good and bad in terms of able to, you know, doing that quickly, but some of the things that, you know, some of our uh, sellers or some of our community members would really be able to benefit from in terms of multi-channel selling as well. Yeah, um, man, that's a, it's, it's a complex Hard question. question. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and the, our launch process is constantly evolving and it, and it depends on the product. I mean, five years ago when we launched bibs on Amazon, it was nearly as competitive as it is now. And we, I mean, we were able to rank so quickly and start selling so quickly. And Amazon, um, you know, really allowed us to scale uh, so quickly, as you mentioned. I mean, we, we saw um, 100% growth in the first three years we were in business. Uh, last year was a little bit slower. Um, but our launch process has evolved over time. I mean, uh, today we don't we don't devote as much time and resources to launching on Amazon as we do uh, our website. Really, um, you know, back in the day we would leverage our email list, which we've grown to uh, about sixty five thousand people. Um, we would use that to kind of launch on Amazon, and, and uh, we put a lot of resources and time and, and uh, into launching on Amazon. Um, but now, you know, we've kind of moved the needle. So we're, we're last year, I want to say we were about 95% Amazon, 5% our own website. Our goal for the past year, at least has been to kind of move the needle and get more, uh, traffic to our website. And today we're sitting at about 80, 20, which is huge for us. Um, and even before COVID, we were starting to, to see some growth on our website. So, um, Today, when we launch new products, it's really um, a balancing between how we leverage Amazon and, um, and, our, and our own website. And really, we're starting to devote more of that uh, thought process to our own website as opposed to Amazon. Cool. And, that, and I see that the questions are coming in, which is great. Stay engaged. Uh, and uh, we're going to be answering your questions uh, in real time with, our, uh, with Aya and Nomi on our team, uh, as well as then... Uh, in a few minutes, moving to the Q and A portion, uh, where we'll read, we'll Rocky will read the questions live for Sam uh, and myself to answer. So, um, I want to talk now about shipping because shipping, as you mentioned, you know, it, it's obviously everyone needs to do that, but it also gets a little bit more complicated when you've got uh, different channels that you're selling through. And I see some questions already about fulfillment, which is getting to the next slide. Uh, don't move the next slide, Rocky, uh, which is about fulfillment, right? Shipping and then fulfillment. So uh, if you could, uh, you know, walk us through a little bit, and you mentioned India. For those that have sourced from India, they know that in general, there's longer lead time. So what are the kinds of considerations that go into, uh, you know, that kind of where you're sourcing from and then, you know, predicting lead time and then, you know, really looking at uh, optimizing your costs, uh, not getting stuck in kind of air freight, being able to predict and to plan ahead shipping by ocean as kind of a more economical way of doing it. Uh, and then within ocean, obviously being able to ship ideally full containers uh, as opposed to less than full container or, and obviously, you know, not uh, air freight. So really the whole thing in terms of optimizing costs, uh, ocean versus air. Uh, and then we can go into uh, the next questions around fulfillment. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we're kind of all over the board in terms of our freight. Now um, we obviously always prefer to send by sea if possible. And um, you know, it wasn't really until a couple of years ago that we really were doing the volume uh, that made that economical. Um, but when we looked at it, you know, and we analyzed the costs of you know, maybe paying a little bit more for storage and, the effects on cash flow of, of kind of loading up on inventory, maybe getting six months of inventory of a product as opposed to three, um, you know, the cost savings were really uh, substantial. So um, especially for our larger items, we ship exclusively by sea unless we're running into a, a stock out situation. Um, you know, our, our fastest moving products, most of them come out of India and um, you know, our lead time in terms of our production lead time in India is actually really efficient and really predictable. Um, but that shipping component can be uh, a little bit more complex in India. And so um, we have tried everything coming out of India and, you know, it's, whereas we can typically get, you know, door to door uh, sea shipment from China in you know, 25 days from China to LA, a warehouse in LA, um, it's more like 45 days, maybe 45 to 55 even out of India. Um, and we've only done that a couple times by sea from India just because of how unpredictable it is. 
Um, so actually what we, we've kind of learned, and we also looked at air freight for stuff coming out of India. I mean, we do a lot of volume um, out of India. And uh, when we really looked at it, um, air freight compared to our suppliers, air express rates uh, was really only saving us like less than 10% on any given SKU. Uh, so when we, when we considered that, um, we, had, we essentially just said, hey, you know, it's way easier for us to use Air Express on these items because most of them are smaller and light. And then we can, um, you know, we can ship them direct Air Express to an Amazon warehouse. We can split up a shipment and send, you know, one or two cartons to a specific warehouse if we have to, as opposed to sending to a warehouse here and then splitting the, the shipment up here and, and sending it to the appropriate warehouses in the U.S. So, um, most of our stuff now in India uh, is exclusively sent via Air Express. It gives us more predict predictability and lead time. Um, it helps us avoid stockouts. We don't. We can carry a lot less inventory here in the U.S. Um, that being said, almost all our stuff coming out of China is done by sea now, and uh, more than fifty percent of our stuff coming out of China is full containers. Um, and uh, we really. Uh, you know, in terms of getting full containers, most of our SKUs were able to do that on one or two SKUs. Um, we have also had success in consolidating orders in within China. Uh, if you have solid uh, relationships with your suppliers, most would be willing to do that. So we'll have, you know, one supplier ship half a container load to another supplier's warehouse. They'll consolidate it there and we'll get a full container and be able to uh, save, you know, thousands of dollars from having to book two separate uh, lesson container loads. So, and, and that's an important uh, point, which goes into, I think, Sam, you mentioned in the, in the beginning, that close relationship with a supplier. Uh, I don't know if the word relationship is an overstatement or understatement, but, um, <laughs> you know, it sounds like, you know, that flexibility in working with a supplier uh, in terms of lead time, but also in terms of even, I know that we discussed a little bit before as well in terms of financing uh, and being having, you know, flexible payment terms, we didn't discuss that in the sourcing section, but just for the audience, that's also a very important factor for any small business to consider, which is flexibility in payment terms. Um, and also the ability to be, you know, to diversify, like we mentioned in terms of duties, but how much also were you able to kind of compare pricing or, or use, you know, pricing for one supplier and a different supplier in negotiations and um, as well, right? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good question. We, uh, We've done a little bit of that. I mean, certainly when our product developer uh, consultant got in, she was like, hey, let's shop these prices. I think we can do better. Um, you know, it's a, tough th it's a tough situation though because, you know, we do have great relationships with our suppliers and uh, we don't want we, them to feel like we're nickel, you know, nickel and diming them. So, um, you know, those are easier conversations to have in, in person. Um, I've, had a, I've visited every single factory that we have, um, uh, have uh, produced at. And so, um, I've, I've had those conversations with factory owners and um, in my experience, uh, it's way more effective to sit down in front of someone and talk about things like pricing, talk about things like payment terms. And, um, you know, really, like you mentioned the payment terms thing, like that, that's something I didn't really even consider until we were a few years into business. I wish I would have done it sooner. I mean, it's definitely easier to have that conversation after you've been doing business with a supplier for a, a long time. Um, but that's huge in an inventory based business to have that flexibility and cash flow. And you'd be surprised at how many suppliers are willing to, um, to negotiate on payment terms. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done a ton of shopping around on our prices, but certainly, um, payment terms is the longer and, uh, the more loyal you are to a supplier. I, I think they do reciprocate in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Great. Um, so in terms of shipping, I, mean, I see half the questions are about this. Um, mm -hmm. Let's get down to you know the bottom line, right? You're you're you know you're shipping product to all kinds of customers, uh, even within the U.S., Canada, and, and you know internationally as well. Um, what is the interface then, you know, in, in terms of the actual final you know final mile, the final you know uh, uh, end customer uh, fulfillment between you know like you mentioned shipping to Amazon uh, versus shipping to your own warehouse uh, versus you know third party fulfillment. Uh, and there are a lot of third-party fulfillment companies out there, you know, as we know, right? Shopify, ShipBob, ShipMonk, uh, ABC Fulfillment, right? There, there's so many of them. Um, and also, obviously, I'm Amazon as well. So if yeah. you can talk about that and, and what, it's, what your experience has been like using a combination of Amazon, third-party fulfillment companies, and your own 
you know, your own fulfillment? Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, as I mentioned, 80% of our volume now goes through Amazon. And so uh, what that looks like typically is uh, we'll get a container from overseas. We'll have it received. Um, well, you know, actually we've been using uh, Amazon Global Logistics on some shipments to ship direct to uh, Amazon warehouses, but typically it goes through a third party warehouse that we use uh, outside of the port of LA. Um, they charge us a container unloading fee. They charge us a carton forwarding fee and we do our bulk storage there at that warehouse. Um, it's it's uh, quite a bit cheaper than Amazon, although not as cheap as what I, I wish it would be to store there. And we kind of use it as just a forwarding warehouse. Uh, they do offer fulfillment services. We don't use them for it. It's, it's frankly too expensive for, for our stuff. Um, in terms of our website fulfillment, up until about a month ago, we were using a third party uh, pick, pack and ship warehouse based out of Kentucky. We had a um, huge falling out with them. Um, you know, they, they were acquired by someone and uh, our pricing changed significantly. A lot of our stuff is, is small and light. Um, which if you're familiar with uh, USPS pricing, um, first class package uh, for anything less than a pound, that's kind of where a majority of our shipments go. Um, so it's really hard on a $15 item to justify paying someone $2 to pick that item and put it into a poly bag. Uh, it just really crushes your margins. So uh, long story short, uh, they were acquired. Uh, our our uh, uh, fees went up significantly. And we just said, you know, hey, I don't like being so dependent on somebody else for such a critical part of our business. So uh, we moved our fulfillment in house. We signed a lease on a small warehouse here outside of Denver um, a couple of weeks ago, actually. And we've been fulfilling, you know, out of here, we do about 80 to hundred orders a day out of this warehouse. We have one part-time warehouse worker who's out there right now, actually packing orders up. With full PP. So yeah. Well, yeah. So totally. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, we, I mean, we're still getting Just because I know Amazon got, got into some trouble with their employees not having a proper PPE. So I'm sure I hired a college student. I'm not sure he's as concerned about it as the Amazon <laughs> warehouse workers. So yeah, so he's, we're managing all our own fulfillment for our website now uh, here, which is, it's gone well so far. So we're, we're optimistic about the future for, for fulfilling uh, ourselves. Okay. Yeah, and this is, and this evolves, right? I mean, like Sam mentioned, uh, you know, business evolves the uh, diversification evolves in terms of Amazon you know, versus uh, your own site or multi-channel fulfillment. So this is something that you may not figure out from day one. Your strategy may change as your business expands to the larger audience listening. Um, I'm just going to ask one final question, Sam, and then we're going to turn it over for the next 10 minutes or so uh, to the open Q&A. Uh, so just one final question, and then uh, we're going to hear some direct questions from, from all of you. Um, so now that your business has started to scale, right? It's five years old or so starting to scale. Um, just some tips in terms of, I don't know, technology, uh, tracking your growth, uh, any sort of other tips you can share that you've picked up to now scale, the, you know, to further scale the business uh, so that it can work uh, and continue to grow, uh, you know, in the years ahead. Yeah. Uh, my, my finance bias is definitely to come out here, but I really uh, like knowing your margins on your products is huge. And uh, as you start out initially, you know, make sure you're leaving uh, enough margin in your product for uh, customer acquisition costs, you know? So uh, when you think about pricing your product, I certainly uh, don't think it's unreasonable to try and include 20 to 30% uh, margin uh, just for your customer acquisition costs. Uh, that's something that we've learned as we've tried to tilt the needle towards our own website. You know, it costs money to get people to your website. Um, Amazon obviously it does too. You pay, certainly pay fees for that. You pay for Amazon PPC, but you know, building that into your margins is huge. And then, you know, as you add new products, uh, considering all those factors, it, it makes things a lot easier when, when you go to launch a product and you know that you have, uh, you know, a solid margin um, in, in the product itself. So that's really hard. Um, they're really important. The other difficult part is managing cash flow for um, any growing business. And so, um, you know, I'm sure we could do a talk, uh, an entire webinar just on oh, yeah, um, sure. financing. Um, but yeah, explore all your options, um, you know, work with your suppliers on payment terms, all that stuff, you know, cash flow is huge in an inventory based business. So, um, make sure you're forecasting that, keep an eye on that. And, uh, it's definitely not easy to do, but it's important. Okay, great. Sam, thank you so much. Um, and that's the theme of this, right? From here to there, 
Uh, those like Dr. Seuss, uh, you may be familiar with that expression, but you need to really, really think about the totality, right, of the, of, of your t the landed cost, essentially, uh, of your product, right? And we really try to explore that from the beginning in terms of sourcing, in terms of payment terms, then shipping, uh, and then all the way through, you know, the duties uh, and all the way through fulfillment and really looking at that uh, and making sure that you're profitable. Uh, and also what might be popular, and again, this is to you know, his audience, what might be popular today may not be popular tomorrow. You should try to think about products that will stand the test of time uh, and that will, you know, always have a need, uh, you know, that your customers or have a large enough kind of addressable market to, uh, to, to a larger audience as well, not just things that might be popular today. Um, great. So why don't we go into the Q&A and, um, and, and launch. Some for myself and for Sam. Okay, yeah. awesome. So I'm going to just kick it off here. Uh, we're going to start with something simple. I think uh, lots of the audience over here has tons of questions for both Sam and Ari, but let's just start with Sam. Where is your business located um, and where is your domestic U.S. distribution points? Yeah, so we're, we're based uh, just outside of Denver, Colorado. Uh, this is where we have our now our new fulfillment uh, for our website. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we have a warehouse in California that does our kind of our bulk storage and forwarding. Um, and then, you know, obviously our inventory is spread out all throughout the country in different Amazon fulfillment facilities. Okay, awesome. Thanks Parker, so for those that don't know, Parker is a, is a town. It's a suburb of Denver, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. right. Oh, cool. I didn't even know that. Um, <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Emma over here has a question. How did you identify your logistics partners, your freight forwarders, warehouse, and fulfillment options? Yeah. Um, you you, you know, touched a bit on the warehouse and fulfillment, but I think particularly, you know, let's focus on the freight forwarders and logistics partners. Yep, sure. So we, uh, it's largely referral based. Um, I'm part of some e-commerce groups that have um, been really helpful for me. Uh, one in particular, e-commerce fuel has been awesome. Um, you know, and it's, it's for me, I, I value, uh, you know, people who have done business with, with other businesses in the past and referrals are huge. And so um, I think even Fredos was a referral to me from somebody within that group. Um, so yeah, I mean, referrals have been huge. Uh, you know, warehouse and fulfillment, it was really just a numbers thing for us. There were only a handful of third party fulfillment centers in the country that could economically fulfill our items that are small and cheap and light. So that was really just a numbers thing for us. Okay, cool. Um, so we've got a couple questions here around pricing and trying to get a sense of how much for, should that shipping element of it cost um, when you're looking at a 40 foot container or when you're looking at even shipping loose cargo, how do you decide if you're really getting a good price, uh, when to ship and how to maximize the pricing on that? Uh, maybe kick it off, Sam, from your perspective, and then Ari can talk about it from uh, the data that we see in the marketplace. Yeah, from my perspective, this is one of the reasons I love, like, the Fredo's platform um, and, and other uh, freight, uh, freight forward, uh, freight broker platforms is that you can compare all those costs up before you commit to anything. So um, you can, you know, like, even within Fredo's, you could build out uh, both of those scenarios. You could say, hey, what would it look like to send a 40 foot container? What would it look like to send two 20 foot containers to different locations and then compare those, those directly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would say that, you know, there's somewhat of an evolution in uh, shipping. I mentioned it um, a little bit in the beginning. Uh, you know, typically you go from this kind of sample to, you know, maybe some initial LCL less than full container load. That would be like if you're shipping a few cubic meters CBMs. Uh, and then kind of maturing into full container loads. Uh, and in general, you know, the 40 foot container uh, is, is generally the most, uh, I guess, scalable, the most efficient way to ship. Uh, you know, typically the cost difference between a 20 foot versus 40 foot is only about 15 or 20% more, although it contains twice as much uh, uh, capacity or volume. So uh, as much as possible, try to go, uh, you know, graduate uh, from LCL to 40 foot container. Uh, the other thing, you know, as you start maturing your business, you also want to look at and making sure that you have a, what's called an annual customs bond as opposed to a, a single entry customs bond. Uh, not, well, not, not official. It usually uh, means that there's less of an issue with customs or getting things uh, stuck in customs. So you could have some savings as well 
uh, you know, by, by kind of graduating to being a larger importer, even if you're just starting out. Um, and then, you know, looking at air freight versus ocean freight, uh, you know, using freight us is, is easy to do that uh, and, seeing the, and, and seeing what your cost would be. Um, you can also mention that there are a lot of other resources, uh, not only on the shipping itself, but other, uh, you know, like other partners that Freight Us works with. So uh, whether it's on the e-commerce side in, make, in optimizing the final fulfillment, also very important. You want to make sure that you're shipping not only to save costs um, in the shipping, right? To ship to LA is a lot cheaper than shipping to Chicago or Dallas or East Coast. But ultimately, where are your customers based, right? Because you do incur a lot of costs on that final mile fulfillment from the warehouse or warehouses to the, the customers. So try to see where your customers are located. Uh, and then this might be easy if you're in you know, Minneapolis, Minnesota and you're selling blankets, uh, you know, because then you have you know, a product that might be popular in a cold environment. But try to see and analyze where your end customers are so that you can also ship and, and, and bake that in as well. Don't just get stuck on the cost of the container or the cost of the LCL, but really think it through the entire supply chain. Also on the sourcing side, don't source from a supplier in the middle of nowhere uh, in China. Try to keep to places that will be efficient to ship from uh, and, and also diversifying as well. All right, I'll, I'll just add on LCL versus full container too. Um, in our experience, we've found that full containers are processed quicker and received quicker uh, than at LCL because there's just a little bit more work done at the destination. Um, so oftentimes if we see it, something that might make sense for an LCL, we might just actually pay a little bit more and do a full container, even though it won't technically be full, um, just to get that quicker uh, processing time. Great. Yeah, that, that ties into the lead time question mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as well. And, and, the, and just to add one nuance on that, and then we'll get to the next question. The um, <clears throat> LCL means that it is part of a larger container, right? There might be five other importers that also have product, right? So what happens is the freight forwarder that you book with will ultimately have to bring it to a warehouse, needs to be broken down, and then needs to be shipped separately. So it adds on at least a week, 10 days, whereas a full container goes straight from the port to the warehouse, whether it's your own warehouse or a third-party warehouse. So it could be the difference of at least seven or 10 days. So great point, yeah. Sam. Yeah. Thanks so much. So that kind of brings us to a question that actually uh, David asked us over here. And David, thank you so much for all of your questions. Uh, Ari, you've spoken to thousands of customers probably since you started at Fredos. I forgot exactly how many years ago is that? Uh, I don't have a count of how many customers I've spoken to. Yeah, Sorry, David. Um, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, we're looking at, you know, as you talk to many customers, you kind of start to see patterns of mistakes that, let's say, newer small businesses that are starting to import find. And then as they graduate to that next level, what the patterns and types of mistakes um, what are, could you call out just like two to three common mistakes that you've seen and two to three really successful habits that we can recommend to people who um, have come to join us today? Okay. Um, diversifying suppliers is, is key. Um, people that are dependent on only one supplier, that's a really bad move. Uh, you should build relationships, but at the same time, diversification, I've, I've used that term at least five times, really, really important. Uh, that was a major pitfall that we saw even with experienced importers. And I'm talking, you know, furniture companies that have imported, you know, import a thousand containers a year who were importing 90% from China and then all of a sudden paying 25% more duties. That is a really big hit. So you really need to look at diversifying. Um, and so that's, I guess, one pitfall, but also potential uh, advantage. Um, also the total cost. So don't just get hung up on the cost of, of the shipping or just the cost of a container but look at the INCO terms, the commercial terms that you're shipping on. That's a very important thing that a lot of, a lot of our customers have been hit with or hurt by uh, in that they worked with a supplier maybe that only worked on one type of term, like they only worked on FOB or they only worked on XWorks. So looking at that also as part of your overall calculation. Um, and then some lessons learned. Uh, so the, on, the, on the US side, it, we do see a growing trend with uh, multi-channel fulfillment because uh, you know, Amazon has a large market and they're continuing to grow, but Amazon has also been increasing pricing uh, you know, for uh, the fulfillment. And um, so you do need to make sure that just as you've diversified on the, on the supplier side, that you've, you are also uh, have the ball rolling to diversify in fulfillment. So that's another growing trend I see with customers that are also you know, using Amazon fulfillment, but also multi-channel 
uh, fulfillment. That's definitely a growing trend, and that's probably why, uh, even in spite of the pandemic, we're seeing uh, that as a growing trend of uh, of um, of not be, you know, diversifying your fulfillment sources. So those are some key points. Yeah, okay, David. great. Um, I'm just going to end up with one or maybe two last questions. Uh, we've got one from Sharon asking Sam a quick question on sea freight. Uh, after you've had your own warehouse, do you still use third party to offload the container or do you offload it yourself? Yeah, we definitely use a third party to offload the container. Just, uh, just from a manpower standpoint, uh, we don't have quite enough space and really kind of goes back to how you uh, build out your logistics network. Really to have a full container from the port of LA to Denver is going to be, you know, another week and probably another, uh, I don't know, 600 to a thousand dollars. And so really it's more efficient for us to have it go to the LA warehouse, have them um, unpack it. And then, you know, whatever we need from there to Denver, we'll send via LTL or uh, for a small parcel even. That's really helpful. Thanks so much, Sam. Uh, one last question from Emily. Uh, just going back, I guess, right now we kind of made it from here to there all the way to, you know, offloading your shipments and bringing it to your warehouse and scaling your business. But maybe bring us back to the beginning when you're, you know, looking for suppliers. How did you get started? Where did you find your um, suppliers? What type of sourcing platforms would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, we really, we started on Alibaba and that's where we found our first manufacturer and uh, who we continue to use to this day. And really since then, it's, it's evolved quite a bit. We hired the product developer. She had existing relationships um, in China specifically that we've leveraged. And uh, when we develop a new product now, uh, we if, if we have an existing manufacturer that we think could produce it, um, even if they haven't in the past, uh, we send it to them and say, hey, is this something you can make? And if if they can't, then we, we say, well, do you know someone, you know, in China or wherever who might be able to? And oftentimes they're willing to, to do that. They have a friend who owns a factory that does maybe something a little bit different. Um, and so really just leveraging those relationships. Um, I've done sourcing uh, shows in China. I haven't found them to be incredibly helpful for us. Um, you know, I, I haven't done any specific to our industry, to baby products. I think that's probably what I'll try next. But um, too overwhelming in my opinion. Uh, so really I like to just, like I said, leverage existing relationships. Okay, awesome. Well, I think that actually brings us full circle in terms of the relationships and really what the whole idea of um, this chat is, is that you know, as much as on the one hand, we're all learning to go digital and go online for everything from ordering your groceries to buying stuff on Amazon for your own you know, personal life to their uh, booking your freight and booking your shipments. Um, I think that a lot of it still comes down to those human connections and really understanding the real life problems that uh, importers and small businesses approach as they try to scale their business. Um, and so I'm so happy that everyone joined today, both in terms of like asking questions, guiding it, uh, interacting with Ari. Thank you so much for your time, Sam. We really appreciate it. If we've got anyone in the audience who would like to join us on one of the future episodes, this was the first one. So uh, kudos to you, Sam, for uh, jumping into the you know um, deep side of the pool. But anyone who wants to join us on the next one, feel free to ping us. Any questions that we didn't get to, uh, we'll try to follow up with you over the course of the week. Or you can always email us uh, at ship at .com. And you can also, just one other uh, initiative that Nomi's doing also to kind of connect everyone who's finding different challenges, particularly over co uh, during since COVID-19, is uh, Fredos.com Insiders on Facebook. So feel free to join our group there where you can also get advice from other importers like yourselves. Thanks so much. Uh, and we look forward to being in touch. Have a great rest of the day. Bye.